welcome back to the realm of unpopular opinions new year has passed i had planned to do this on the 30th but the 30th has passed and i had a lot of thing to do things to do so i am throwing this out there now first up we will do the more positive video which is top 10 9 books i think it's 10 books of 2021 that i read this year i don't think a single one of them actually came out this year but in any case I love all 10 of these. I would go to hell for all 10 of these and you know what the video is. So let's just get into it. All 10 of these I read at certain points during the year and I'm not really sure that I am confident in when I read all of them, but I will try and make it in order. In any way you can, in any case, you can check on Goodreads, but let's go. The first one that I know I read at the beginning of January or rather finished it because I started it in 2020 is Anne of Green Gables by Ella Montgomery. Any one of the three books, the first three books, could go here because I sort of think of them as like one entire story, if that makes sense. Nothing past book three we will not be talking about, but maybe in the most disappointing category. But Anne of Green Gables has to take the first spot because I finally read them this year. I read them as a kid, Anne of Green Gables and Anne of Avonlea, but that was a translation and it's an awful translation and I didn't remember anything. So after the show and we watched the old from the 80s show too this year, so it was just Anne Central. This has to be one of my favorite classics because L.M. Montgomery makes you feel like you are at peace and like there is so much hope and happiness and joy to be found even though she has her dark darkness and dark moments obviously because Anne's story is essentially a sad beginning but it's just beautiful her writing is beautiful because she manages to also be funny she is really funny which I didn't expect at all when I started this I thought she would just be like whimsical and for children but she is really really funny she has that really dry sarcastic humor it really shines with Marilla obviously but even Anne later <laughs> kind of has dry humor the more she grows up I'm not sure where the first book leaves off because they all kind of melded together in my head but the first book is essentially Anne's childhood when she gets to the Cuthberts and her slow growing up and obviously the best romance that we have to mention which is her and Gilbert and how that's blooming and how she gains friends definitely rejects the fact that she is not just academic rivals with Gilbert and this is just an overall cottagecore classic that I think if you've not read because you think you might not enjoy I would absolutely recommend it even if you don't enjoy classics because technically this was written like in the last century it's not that old and I think she manages to capture language that's fairly simple. The one thing that she describes a lot is nature, but I love that. So if you don't, maybe just skim through those passages, but I loved it. I really, really loved her describing of flowers and of the different seasons and the landscapes that Anne discovers when she gets to the Cuthberts. So this is just a classic classic for a reason and it will bring you peace to read this. I see myself reading this genuinely every year from now on. <laughs> as long as we're going in order it is finally time to talk about Attack on Titan which shaped the beginning of my year. I It got me back into anime and into manga simultaneously. I was obsessed with it for months so we need to mention it but I am particularly highlighting No Regrets because we all know how I feel about the main manga and the main story. We will not get into that here. But No Regrets remains one of my favorite pieces of manga in general because of the way that it manages to make you care about people you've never seen before very quickly. It's a two-parter or a one-parter, depends on what you have. This is the, this is the full color edition though it is in German, so I am going to have to get an English one. But it is stunning, and the fact that it wasn't even made by Isayama is kind of what makes me love it. 
because it's so much better and the <laughs> again don't like to compare art because it's mostly personal preference but this drawing style is stunning especially when it's in color it's stunning i think a woman drew that and a guy wrote it and you can tell you can tell that a woman was drawing this because Levi has never been that pretty aside from season three of the show. That's all I will say. But the story itself hits you hard very quickly. And that's why I think it's my favorite. I think the strength of this world lies here because you get to know the people and how everyone's behaving, how everyone's living, the story of the underground, how some people had to change. Some people had to learn things. It just, I feel like, the strength of the story is cemented here regardless of the main series and what you feel about it but I had to highlight this because if it didn't make me so sad I think I would reread this more often because it's truly a work of art and let me see if there's anything in particular that I want to highlight like I mean you can tell a woman drew this and that's all I will say. That's all I will say. This is Levi through the lens of a woman and a guy who's way better at writing than Isayama, which is again controversial, but I don't care. This is my favorites list. So Attack on Titan, no regrets, takes the number two spot. Next up is obviously the entirety, but I can't hold up the volume that I put in the in the list because I don't have it yet so I'll just put up something random that I've never really showed you before but like Tokyo Ghoul I mean obviously you knew this was gonna be on the list if you saw my review of it or the mid-year tag whatever it was called the entirety of Tokyo Ghoul is now one of my favorite things ever not just manga anime I mean I'm all only waiting for the second box set and the last of the novels and I will have anything to do with the world. These are just literally books of illustrations with his comments if you saw the bookshelf tour video. So I'm holding it up with Toka and Kaneki. Anything to do with Tokyo Ghoul I will now consume. <laughs> I am reading his new series. I will be buying the new series. He is now a favorite and the story just really resonated with me and without spoiling too much the ending is what cemented it as a favorite because not only do people that write manga not really finish it they don't really have the intention of finishing it until they run out of everything that they want to milk both of his series like i'm considering this a series even though it's really not but you you get it if you've read it took like four years and he wrapped it up perfectly in my opinion even if some of that wasn't intended he wrapped it up absolutely perfectly and it was stunning I loved it and I am trying really hard not to spoil everything but the characters resonated with me I was invested with even the minor characters that appear a couple of times I grew to love some people that I actually hated a lot of the villains you understood why they were the way they were he managed to do what Isayama wanted to do which is to get you care about both sides of the conflict by showing them both from the beginning and why they hated each other which was very successful he is a wonderful artist i think my favorite manga artist and i've seen read a lot at this point so i know he's my favorite even though he will always in this, these books say that he's not that talented but i mean they always say that when they are for some reason so beautiful art wonderful story the ending cemented it because the ending usually makes the series and this is one of my favorite things ever i'm only sorry i don't have more merch but let me see if i can find like a drawing i wanted to put up the volume this volume i wanted to put it up the picture of the second box set that matches this one but obviously i don't have that box set yet so i couldn't in any case Tokyo Ghoul for the win and I even though Kaneki is my favorite character I can't say that with confidence because a lot of I cared about all of them I cared about all of them there was a random minor character I cried about in the finale so yeah he is excellent at making you understand where everyone's coming from and honestly everyone should just 
follow his example. I know he was overworked, so maybe fix that bit, but a lot of the mangas are just milking it and writing it as they go along. And even if he didn't plan out the ending, it feels like he did, he did and that's, that's what mattered to me. Next one is again a little bit obvious and I'm gonna have difficulty holding it up, so Dune. <laughs> Or rather, Children of Dune, because I read the other two Dune, Dune books in 2020. I finally finished Children of Dune, and it was a strange experience, because I started it in 2020, wasn't in the mood for it. I put it down for like six months. But every time I picked it back up, I was enjoying myself. I feel like I just needed a break from the world, because it's very hefty and not really for binging. But before I went down to the seaside in July, I think I had like a hundred and something pages left. And I sat down all night and I was like, you're gonna finish this because you are enjoying it. I have no idea why you are prolonging wrapping this up. And I did enjoy it. I loved it. It was a terrific ending. There, after this trilogy, there's a reason why it's called the Dune Trilogy. I didn't have any need to read on. Although I read the summaries of the rest and I think I'm happy that he wrapped this up in a way where you can just read this as a trilogy because safe to say that I'm definitely not interested in anything past this. But this finished in a way that I didn't expect to be so satisfying. And while again, this is a very heavy book, not something I would pick up for fun necessarily, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I think that the ending was excellent. A bit complex, perhaps, but I think it was very satisfying where he went with it in the in the finale and the change of protagonists I didn't really enjoy back when I read it in December, but I think that's because I read the first two books very close together, so I was used to the set of protagonists. But after the break, I fell in love with the new protagonists, so I was able to enjoy it a lot more and cemented this trilogy as definitely again a worth it classic in my opinion if you have the stamina for something like this the next two i read both in august so i'm not really sure what the order is there let's just let's just do it like this and that would be kenobi i read that in august and i think i started it in july this is the only Star Wars book, shockingly, that I read this year. For some reason, I didn't necessarily take a break from Star Wars. I am always, as you can see, into Star Wars. But I think I watched it too much last year. I watched The Clone Wars like twice in 2020. I watched all the movies around New Year's and January. So this year I wasn't really <laughs> binging Star Wars content, if that makes sense. I'm watching The Clone Wars again now. I'll watch the movies in 2022 for sure, but this was the only book that I read in 2021 and I'm very happy I did because as soon as I found out what the plot of the Kenobi show would be, I knew I had to read this because this was, this was George Cannon and I always want to know what George Cannon was so I can know what they did wrong because as we all established already, I despise, despise Disney Star Wars. But this was not necessarily a book where every single page was worth it because as I said in my vlog, a lot of the stuff was extra about characters you don't really care about. But that's not how I rate. That's not how I rate Star Wars books. I rate them based on the main point and the main plot revolving around Kenobi and what we found out about him and how he's doing, how it was written, how he was handled as a character. That was absolutely a five star, so this has to go in my favorites because it's a worthwhile addition. And I hate the fact that it's Legends now. I just will never stop dunking on Disney Star Wars. And I think if you're a fan of him as a character, this is definitely worth it. And if you're maybe interested in what they kind of might base the show on, I would definitely read this. And in general, if you're a fan of Star Wars, especially the prequel era, worth it, absolutely worth it. There's a lot of extra stuff, but it all kind of weaves into the main story and the point of it and what he does on Tatooine after the fall of Anakin Skywalker. This is essentially what it's about. It's his arrival on Tatooine and what he does there and what the point is of him being there and how he feels about everything that occurred even sure if I showed you that I bought this but I remember when I was talking about it in 
the August wrap up and that would be <laughs> that would be the Bungo Stray Dogs light novel too. I think all of the novels could go here apart from number six which we do not mention in my presence. I think all of the novels could really go here but I had to choose between this one and 55 minutes because I think they are my favorites. I, it, I had to give it to this because if something manages to get such a large emotional reaction out of me, it's really good. <laughs> Not the emotional reaction that Beast got out of me, but this is like the exact opposite of that. <laughs> I sobbed on both, but one of those was bad. This one was good. I think it's because it was written from Oda's perspective that makes it so impactful to me. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be written from Dazai's perspective because that's not the point of his character. We never get his perspective, I think. Or, I mean, we get it a little bit, but not internally, just, <laughs> just narrating or something, I think, in 55 minutes. But this had to be the most well-thought-out novel emotionally because everything that Oda notices when he's around Dazai is heartbreaking. And, again... I think with every single chapter, there's four in here, I read. I was just weeping. I'm not even kidding, weeping. It took me two days to read this because I needed to take an emotional break in between. And of course I bought it. I want to support the author for doing this. But it made me unable to watch the show or see anything related to the two of them without wanting to cry. Just straight up start crying. So I'm not sure if I were, will ever read this again if I'm being very, very honest. I wanted to have it though. Because it's absolutely stunning and wonderfully crafted. And it's worth having, I think, if you're a fan. I'm trying to find like, yeah, <laughs> all I will show because I do not want to recall this. Fair warning though, if you cried about this in the show, don't pick it up. Just for your own self-care, do not pick it up. But it had to be my favorite again because it's just so, probably the deepest that this series has ever gone and I appreciate it for that, but I'm not sure if for my own well-being. I will never pick this up again, but it was wonderfully written, so worth it, I guess, but only once. <laughs> this one was a shock when I was going through my log and when I discovered that I wanted to put it on this list. The Killing Place by, by Tess Gerritsen. Again, I'm not really a fan of thrillers in book format. I prefer to watch them because I think it's not even a comparison between like books and TV shows because with the TV shows you get the music and the acting and the sense of dread that I don't think books can properly emulate. But this was the first book where I actually felt like that was possible. That's why I have to put it on here. The first thriller ever where I felt the atmosphere and the dread and the anticipation, I was quite literally on the edge of my seat at times because I think she managed to capture what thrillers should be perfectly and this is the only time that she succeeded. I've read like a few of her books now and in some other thrillers that we will talk about in another video but this is the first time where I felt like a thriller could give me the thrill that TV mysteries could. The atmosphere was impeccable, the characters, the character emotions were palpable the main plot of the book is horrifying, obviously, but it got me to feel what I never thought book thrillers would be able to make me feel, and I appreciated for that, and it had to be on my favorites of this year because that's very new for me. I didn't think thrillers could do what this one did. The next one is one that was, again, not really a surprise, but I was surprised by how much I actually enjoyed it, and that would be Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. I loved this book so much, but to be fair, I had the foundation of loving Treasure Planet as a kid and as an adult and of loving the Long John Silver graphic novels. But what shocked me about this was, first of all, I didn't know he was Scottish, so 
my favorite classics writer is Scottish, which was shocking, truly. And what I appreciated about him is because he is so concise. A lot of classics writers, you know, had to be paid by the page or by the word or whatever. So they bullshit a lot. Like there's, they describe everything from the rooms to the voyages to the, they just describe things in painstaking detail. And I loved Stevenson because he doesn't do that in either of his novels. I'm not sure if he does that in the others, but he is very concise. He tells a story that he wants to tell. He doesn't talk for like 400 pages when he could only talk for like 100. For example, my favorite <laughs> example of this is when they go actually to Treasure Island and I was expecting like a long sea voyage and I was getting ready to just be very, very bored. He doesn't do that. He literally just says, anyway, this is what happened on the journey. We are not going to be describing the journey. We are on the island. So yes, you have no idea how much I appreciated that. He is now one of my favorite classics authors, if not the favorite. He is a joy to read because he is Scottish. So he has a lot of that dialect and slang, I guess, which obviously I can't confirm if it's now even used anymore, but I think it was very fun to read. And he cemented Long John Silver as the true gray morality not in the sense that now modern authors actually use gray morality but he is like the blueprint he does questionable stuff but you still love him and you root for him and he is a very charismatic character and even jim hawkins admits that in the end and him and the doctor and the rest of them actually let him go and they're not too sorry that they let him go and the fact that he is the one the only one of the pirates who is Gray, and he is the only one who escapes in the end. I also really appreciate it. This is obviously the full collection. I will be reading the rest, but for 2021, I have to say that Treasure Island is truly one of the gems that confirmed my love for classics when they are not done for the money or taught in schools because 90% of the stuff that's taught in schools is just, just worthless crap. Next one is going to be obvious. Now we're up to the end of the year is Noragami. Again, this was the year of the manga. One of my favorites, absolutely. And this came very close to Sui Ishida's drawing because these, this woman can draw wonderfully. It's like crisp, clean, beautiful drawings where you can actually pay attention to what's going on when there's action. That's very rare for manga. It's a beautifully drawn story, a beautifully written story that's just woven with humor, but also serious stakes. To be fair, I don't know how this will end, but I feel like it's worth it even without knowing how it will end because they made it almost episodic. There are certain events that happen and when that's over, they're not that impactful for what's gonna happen next. So I think I am okay putting this on my favorites list without knowing how it's gonna end. It could still potentially be so bad that I get angry, but I will still never regret for having the rest, read the rest because it's absolutely stunning. And I will try and find something to show you, but I need to make sure it's not a spoiler, which is, which is very difficult because this is one of the later volumes. <laughs> Kiyun and Takemi Kazuchi are absolutely my new favorites and I think you already know that so I'm just showcasing it and let me just find something. I don't know, it's just, it's just a stunning, it's a stunning art style, one of the really really prettier ones that I've encountered in, in manga anime. I mean just the cover. The cover alone is literally, literally stunning. And this is now absolutely one of my favorites. I will collect all of the volumes. The story is just quite unique, even though it kind of reminds you of something that you've never really read or seen, but it's, I think, very unique. And the adaptation is wonderful. It's definitely wonderful. And I wish there was more. I wish it got the love <laughs> that a lot of other anime get. It is definitely not unpopular, but to be fair, I don't even see anyone talk about it anymore anywhere online because it's no longer an anime. I feel like the anime really gets way more people talking about it than the mangas do, but 
I love it. I love it so much and it's just a favorite of all time now, not just of this year, but it had to be highlighted. Don't want to talk too much about it because I mean it is a very recent wrap up. Next up is a book that I'm going to talk about in my December wrap up so I don't really want to talk about it three times, <laughs> but Jane Eyre. I mean, that's the only one from December I can highlight, really, and that's the last one on this list. Jane Eyre. It has to be on here because it falls into that, that category I've already talked about. See, a lot of classics this year. A lot, classics and manga kind of takes up my favorites of this year, I guess. <laughs> but it falls into the line of classics that I wasn't sure if I would enjoy because it's long. And, like, if, it, if she would bullshit about unimportant stuff, I would hate it. This was absolutely perfect. This was just perfect. I see myself rereading this very soon. It's not just a romance, but obviously the romance is at the heart of it. There's a lot of society and everything that classics kind of do. She's like Jane Austen, but in a very different setting and less less purely romantic, if that makes sense. Even though the romance is at the heart of it, I just didn't feel the way I felt when I'm watching, reading Jane Austen. But this was absolute perfection. Again, I will talk more about it in my wrap-up, but it had to be on here because it just topped off the year perfectly and it's so worth it. If you've watched any of the adaptations, although I would only recommend the 20, do 20, the 2011 version with Michael Fassbender and Mia Wasikowska because this, the others are just not, not, not great in my opinion. I tried out some of the others perfect book just perfect book I have no complaints look forward to the wrap up for more details I love it wraps up the video perfectly I think and these are my top 10 of 2021 I love them to bits and let me know what you thought about them if it's anything negative don't be too harsh because I will not be able to take that <laughs> I'm kidding but don't be too harsh because I will argue you and let me know what your favorites of the year are, are like top 10, 5, 1, whatever you want to want to tell me. I wouldn't really single out one book. It's always more than one. So I wouldn't even know where to start if I had to single out just one. But these are my favorites. I hope you enjoyed. I hope it wasn't too painful to listen to or too long. Again, timestamps in the description. You can just skip around and watch what you're interested in but again that's kind of spoilery to look at the timestamps of these kinds of videos so do that at your own peril I don't know what to tell you hope you enjoyed I will see you in the next video which will be negative Nelly which I always have a lot of fun with anyway see you in the next video